everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations here at the Classic Learning Fest. For anyone unfamiliar with the CLT, we are a college entrance exam and assessment suite for grades 7 through 12. And one thing that distinguishes the CLT as a test is its content. Two thirds of the passages on any CLT exam come from our author bank. This is a list comprised of men and women who have contributed to the richness of philosophy and thought that we have inherited. These are authors you're likely to encounter in your college career and hopefully you'll engage with them throughout your life. So most Thursdays of the academic year to help us really develop a true common canon, a faculty member from one of our partner colleges helps us explore one author from the CLT bank. Um, tonight, we are joined by Dr. McBrayer from Ashland University to discuss Frederick Douglass. And we have some other special guests I wanted to introduce first before getting to Ashland. Um, we're joined by CLT 10 award winners tonight. The CLT 10 is our equivalent to the PSAT, and the awards are analogous to the National Merit Program. Um, we're so proud of these students, and we always love talking with them. No CLT 10 scholar that I've gotten to talk to before has failed to impress me with their, their poise and their depth. Um, their test scores only hint at what bright, interesting, and serious young people they are. So thank you all for joining us, and we're so glad you're here. Um, maybe briefly, you could say your name, where you're coming from, uh, where you go to school. Um, and we'll start with Eleanor, if that's OK. I'm Eleanor Story. I live in Washington, DC, and I go to the St. Jerome's Institute. Can I interrupt real quick? I'm sorry. Uh, what are your parents' names, Ms. Story? Um, Benjamin Story and Jenna Story. I know your father and I have no of your mother. <laughs> um, I'm Ellen Ritchie. I'm from Eubank, Kentucky, and I'm homeschooled. I'm Kaiser Hemmelberg from Ashland, Nebraska, and I'm homeschooled. I'm Liliana Hale from North Carolina, and I go to Commission Leadership Academy. Um, my name is Nuala Woodall. I'm from Virginia, and I go to Veritas School. I am Vincent Martucci Bond. I'm from Maryland and I am homeschooled. All right, thank you all for uh, choosing to spend your Thursday evening with us. Really looking forward to you hearing from you about this book. Um, so now for Ashland University. Uh, the university was founded in 1878. It consists of four academic colleges, arts and sciences, business and economics, nursing and health sciences, as well as Ashland Theological Seminary. Ashland University places great emphasis on the importance of each individual. The phrase accent on the individual has been their motto for many years and characterizes as well the nature and content of the campus environment. They have an incredible student faculty ratio of only 13 to one. Um, because of our topic tonight, I wanna to highlight for you one particular program at Ashland. The Ashbrook Scholar Program may be the finest liberal arts program in politics and history in the nation. It has a national reputation for the quality of the students it attracts and the superb faculty who teach them. The caliber of people coupled with a comprehensive liberal arts curriculum that emphasizes the reading of original historical texts and documents come together to form an undergraduate program that cannot be found anywhere else in the country. It is a rigorous program for serious public spirited students with a passion for civic leadership. Uh, the reading list is incredible, and I'm going to put a link to the chat um, in the chat to that now, along with the CLT author bank. So they're both lists worth perusing, and you'll see a lot of overlap between them. Um, we have with us tonight Greg McBrayer, who is Associate Professor of Political Science, Director of Citizen Programs, and Director of the Ashland University Core Curriculum. He grew up mostly in Colorado and Berlin, Germany, but his family is from Georgia, and that's where he calls home. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland, his MA from the University of Georgia, and his BA from Emory University. Dr. McRayer has written mostly on ancient political thought, including Aristotle, Thucydides, Plato, and Xenophon, but he also has a keen interest in the great works of American political thought and has great admiration for Frederick Douglass. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about Douglass. Uh, the screen is yours, Dr. McRayer. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. Um... 
Can you see my PowerPoint now? Cool. All right, rock and roll. Um, as I hear, heard you guys introduce yourselves, I realized I lived just about everywhere where you guys mentioned. I don't know if you caught that, but Maryland, Virginia, all those places, DC, I lived in all those places. So it's nice. And then Ashland, not, not Nebraska, but it's Ashland, Ohio. So it's very, very similar. Um, and I also know that there are 12 people who are present, but they're uh, somehow registered differently. So I don't know if they can throw up questions in the chat or whatever, but feel free as, as needed. I've already told the folks uh, I met at the beginning, I just, I'll just repeat it. Um, so Natalie gave a very nice introduction. And by the way, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'll give uh, two things. One is a thanks and then an apology. So thank you for inviting me, but then an apology of sorts, because at the Ashbrook Center, one of the things we don't really do is lecture. We typically teach by reading primary text together and engaging in a conversation. So to the extent that you guys can interrupt me uh, as you see fit and ask questions, uh, disagree, uh, I know that might sound strange because I'm old and therefore I have authority, but I could be wrong. So you guys should feel free to push back whenever you see it. But I'll just try and give you um, some of my thoughts and questions about one of my favorite texts in the history of American political thought. Maybe my favorite text, actually, uh, Frederick Douglass's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave written by himself. And I could go into some detail about um, even the title, I think, is sort of unique and strange and worth reflecting on. And if anybody has any questions or thoughts about that before we move on, you notice that his, his own name is in there and it's written by himself. And those of you who read the whole thing notice that uh, we're greeted with a couple of introductory prefatory remarks by other people before we get to Douglas. And I think that these people, so Wendell Phillips uh, and William Lloyd Garrison, and the idea, and these were leading abolitionists at the time, and the idea was that they were sort of vouching for the fact that a slave had written this. Because when you read this, it's extraordinarily incredible that a slave could have written this. It's a beautiful text. And in fact, people did accuse this book of not having been written by Douglas himself. So I'll begin uh, very simply. Let's see if this works. Okay, good. So this is a, just a simple outline of my, my talk tonight. I'm calling it um, something like The Liberal Education of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and this is what I'll focus on. And here's an outline. I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce what I'm talking about, and then really two main parts, and then I'll conclude. One is the education that Douglas received, uh, and I'll focus on um, a, a, his literary education, but also um, this sort of education and dehumanization, is what I'll call it. And then secondly, I'll turn to the education that Douglas gave us. And then finally, I'll, I'll just conclude with some remarks and questions. I'll, I'll probably be 35 to 45 minutes, um, unless you guys talk, as I hope you do, in which case it'll get longer. But if there's time at the end, uh, we'll do some things there, okay? I happen to have a friend uh, who teaches at, uh, actually, it's a former student of mine who teaches at um, Hillsdale College in Michigan. And uh, as I was preparing uh, this talk, he was kind enough. I, I said, look, I could use some images. I don't usually lecture, and so I don't use PowerPoint. So I, I, I need some pictures because, you know, the kids, they need, they need pictures and cartoons and stuff like that. And so uh, my, my, for, for my friend, my former student, he teaches at Hillsdale College, and he is responsible for... Hillsdale College procuring um, original copies of Frederick Douglass's narrative. So this is an actual photograph of a first edition copy of the book that they have at Hillsdale College. And here's just a couple of pictures. Um, this is the, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, as you can see, and there's chapter one. There's sort of the inserts, the first couple of pages. And there's a nice picture of him. He's very handsome, by the way. Uh, Frederick Douglass is said to have been the most photographed person in the 19th century. I don't know if that's true or how one counts that or verifies it, but I've checked it a number of places and the assertion is made by lots of folks. Um, so yeah, um, there's another one. Uh, this is a different autobiography. Douglas wrote three autobiographies. Uh, this is the cover of the original edition of one of the others, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. There he is as an old man, I think actually even handsomer as an old man, something to which I can aspire, I suppose. Uh, and I think that's about it. Yeah, good. Um, so when I originally talked about this, I was thinking when I was asked to give this talk, I sort of thought about what would I call this? And I sort of thought, well, let's let's begin with the idea that this is Frederick Douglass's liberal education or an education in freedom, because what I want to focus on is is how Douglass understands freedom and its relationship to education or try this in a different way. How does one become free? For Douglass, the answer seems to lie in education. And therefore, the education he gives is also with a view to liberating other human beings. So I'm, I'm focused on connecting Douglas's education with Douglas's freedom. And Douglas, he wants us to see very clearly that, and his story confirms this, that these two ideas are closely connected. Freedom and education are closely connected. To be free, to be self-governing, one must be educated. 
And that's what Douglas, uh, that's what drove Douglas to pursue an education for himself. And it's why he so passionately uh, sought to educate other human beings. The flip side of this, of course, is that if you want to enslave people, uh, you must keep them in ignorance. So Douglas sought to learn, and perhaps the most obvious place to start, and we started our opening comments this evening with this, with anyone's education, uh, is learning how to read. So I'm going to begin with Douglas's account of when he learned to read. He begins in chapter six, uh, halfway through, but it's it's somewhat essential. Um, I'll just read a few of these passages. So as was as was noted in the beginning, uh, who noted this actually? Which one of you young ladies noticed this for me? Ellen did. Yeah, there you are. Hey, Ellen. Sorry, there. All the, when I put the screen up, you guys kind of go away on the side. So, Ellen did. Um, so Douglas is still a young boy, and he's been sent to Baltimore. Um, and conditions in Baltimore are a little better than being a slave on the plantation. Uh, there's a lot of curiosities in here. And, and one of the things that I hope you'll see is that what Douglas begins to realize is that all that slavery rests on certain contradictions in the mind, um, that it's it depends upon believing opposite things at the same time. Um, and so I'm not trying to reduce this to a simply intellectual thing. I think it's I mean, there's obviously a lot more at stake than that. But what Douglas sees is that there are these inherent contradictions in slavery, okay? Um, and reading is one of them. Uh, so why? So we moved to Baltimore, where slavery is better than it is out in the plantation. And why is it better in the city? He says it's better in the city because um, people don't want to get the reputation as being a bad slave owner. But that tacitly recognizes that if you think worse of your neighbor because they sleep, treat their slaves poorly, it tacitly recognizes that there's something wrong about this sort of be, this wrong, this bad treatment of human beings. And so something about being out in the country where you're far away from your neighbors makes it more acceptable because nobody can see you're doing this nasty thing. And so as soon as you're seen doing it, you realize it's bad and therefore you cover it up or you try to behave more in a better manner. So that's a kind of, it's, so in other words, what he sees is that the slave owners themselves recognize that slavery is bad by their actions. Whenever they're around other people, they don't want to treat them poorly. So a, a number of things I'm going to read here. This is in chapter six, uh, maybe two or three paragraphs down. Uh, but I like to keep a number of things in mind. One of, I've already asked you to reflect on the title, uh, right? A narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave written by himself. I would also encourage you to think about who Douglass is writing for. And you guys should feel free to jump in if you have any guests. Who's his audience, do you think? Who do you think Douglas is writing for? I would think that Douglas is writing for the public who is unconvinced or undecided on the issue of whether they should support or oppose slavery. Uh, that's exactly what I think. So, Vincent, who is he not therefore writing for, since you nailed who he is writing for? And by the way, uh, and what color are those people typically? Um. The majority of them would be white, right? And he would not be writing for slaves or um, rich white Southerners. Got it. I, I, I'll just I'll qualify this just a little bit. I think he's writing for everybody, of course. And there's a way in which secondarily and tertiarily he's maybe writing for slaves and slave owners. But I think you're right. I mean, these people already have their minds made up, right? Uh, I'm a slave. I know it's bad. I don't need Frederick Douglass to tell me that slavery is bad. And if I'm a slave owner, I probably already have very strong opinions as well. I suspect that this book is largely written to whites, largely written to northerners, and largely written to people who sort of are on the fence, as Vincent kind of said, like, I don't know, slavery doesn't sound so great, but maybe it's not that bad. There are all these white southerners talking about how better off the slaves are this, that, and the other. By the way, where is Frederick Douglass? I mentioned Baltimore, and maybe this is unfair because one of you is actually from there, but where is he? Where's, ba where's Baltimore, and where is he before he's in Baltimore? Yeah, go ahead. Just jump in. Baltimore is in Maryland and right? on the Chesapeake Bay. Good. So, all right, Vincent, you're on the hook. Sorry, you keep volunteering. So these white Northerners who are sort of maybe on the fence about slavery. Where, why does Maryland and Baltimore, why is this so important? And by the way, Wendell Phillips mentions this in the beginning, one of the prefatory materials, that Maryland is very important. If I were going to write a book about how awful slavery is, I would have chosen Mississippi. 
Why does he choose Maryland? This is a curiosity. And I suspect that what's going on here is they're trying to show you this is where they say slavery isn't that bad. And if it's, and I, I hope as you read and as I read, I sort of think this is evil. So if you can show that it's evil, even in these border states, imagine how much more evil it must be down in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina. And so there's a weird, I mean, I, I mean, it's paradoxical, right? My common sense thing would be, no, no, I'd find the worst version of slavery in Shone. I think they're showing you that even this so-called, you know, the, the Southern apologist, the slave-owning apologist will say, oh, look, slavery is not that bad. And I think what Douglas is up to is showing you, look, if it's this bad in Maryland, imagine what it must be like in Mississippi. And so I think that that's even more toward persuading uh, this Northern audience. Okay, so he goes to Baltimore and he meets this lovely woman named Sophia Auld. And she begins to teach him how to read. This is extremely important. Um, this is the second paragraph in chapter six. But alas, Douglas says, this kind heart had but a short time to remain such. The fatal poison of irresponsible power was already in her hands and soon commenced its infernal work. I hope you know that infernal means of hell. Like she's, this is sort of devilish work that she's doing. That cheerful eye under the influence of slavery soon became red with rage. That voice made it all of sweet accord changed to one of harsh and horrid discord. And that angelic face gave place to that of a demon. As we go through the text, and as I am going to try and go through this lecture, I, I want you to see that slavery is awful for the slave. But rhetorically, one of the things I think that Douglas is trying to show you is that slavery is not only bad for the slave, and I think that one of you also mentioned this a moment ago, but slavery is also bad for the slave owner. In other words, it takes this sweet angel of a woman. Slavery turns this white young woman into an evil human being. I see some chats in the question. Natalie, if you don't mind, could you keep an eye on the chat? And if there are questions, just feel free to shout them out to me. I have trouble paying attention to the chats and, and talking and listening. So, All right. So, so what happened? Why did she stop teaching him to read? Um, uh, as was already mentioned earlier, um, her husband comes home. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, and she very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, if you give an N-word an inch, he will take an L. An N-word should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best N-word in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that N-word, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. Is the master right or wrong that learning will somehow make Douglas unhappy with being a slave? I think he is, in a sense, correct, because it will make Douglas aware of his um, stance then and aware of his um, uh, inferiority to his master and how um, unjust the relationship is. I think that's right, Kaiser. And, and Douglas himself says as much. He's like, look, actually, this did make me unhappy. And he, the rest of up until he sort of decides he's going to become free, you see this increasing dissatisfaction with his life. So there's this strange sense in which he might, I mean, for this, I mean, he's not trying to help him, obviously, Mr. Old, but he's right. This will make him miserable because he'll become aware. He'll become, his mind will become open to other possibilities, including the possibility that he's not meant for slavery. And so there's this way in which uh, un unintentionally, Mr. Ald actually taught Frederick Douglass something really important, even though it means his short-term unhappiness. Uh, Douglass says he was right. Uh, if I'll just continue just a few lines left down from where I left off. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty. To wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. 
So something about keeping me ignorant was the key to keeping me a slave. Uh, um, from that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted, and I got it at the time when I least expected it. Whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which, by the merest accident, I had gained from my master. Through, uh, though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and a fixed purpose at whatever trouble to learn how to read. Uh, the very decided manner with which he, my master, spoke and strove to impress his wife with the evil consequences of giving me instruction served to convince me that he was deeply sensible of the truths he was uttering. Okay, so here's the opening parts for how uh, he taught himself how to read. So step one to learning how to read. Mrs. Ald, there portrayed, uh, is trying to teach him. But now she's forbidden, and so nobody's going to teach him how to read. Does anybody remember how else, I mean, I can just tell you, but I, I'd be more interested to hear what you guys would say. How does Douglas learn how to read now that he doesn't have anybody to teach him? There are a few methods that he, he pursues to learn how to read. All right. One is he, when he finds a book, he hoards it and he keeps these things away. Uh, he reads spare scraps of newspaper. My favorite story uh, about how he learned how to read by the way, it was illegal to uh, teach slaves how to read in many states. One of my favorite stories about how he learned how to read was uh, he, would, he would trick the neighborhood boys in Baltimore into teaching him how to read by pretending to know things that he knew he did not know. So he would say, hey, Vincent, I know how to spell ship. And then the, the little white boy would be like, ah, no, you don't. You go first. And he's like, well, I'll bet you. So they bet. And then Douglas would try and fail. And the white boy would be like, no, it's S-H-I-P. And then Douglas would remember that. And then he would go around continuing to trick all the little kids in his neighborhood uh, to learn how to read. Can you imagine this app? You guys, maybe you do, but this appetite for learning, uh, it's so strong, I suppose. I wish that m my American students approached learning with the passion and rigor of a Frederick Douglass. It's, it's strange that when it's there and for us to take, we just, we just don't take it. But in any event, he's, he, starts, he begins to, lead, to learn by hook or by crook. And this is sort of what I refer to as formal education, learning to read. And by the way, one of the books he read was called The Columbian Orator, which he read and reread and reread and reread. And this probably explains why he's such a powerful speaker. He sort of imbibed and became second nature for him to sort of speak in rhetorical ways. But, but the narrative, as I'm sure you all know, doesn't only relate Douglas's formal education. He learned a lot from simply observing the world around him. In particular, and I've already alluded to this, he learned a great deal about human nature by reflecting on the brutality of slavery. It was a kind of negative example, if you will. In other words, he learns what's human by what's being distinctly lost about human beings who are slaves. Douglas sees what is distinctively human in the systematic attempts made to blot out the slave's humanity. Human nature for Douglas reveals itself despite or perhaps even because of its resilience in the face of brutalization. Think about what that word brutalization means. This is a word that he uses consistently. The slaves are trying to brutalize, excuse me, the slave owners are trying to brutalize the slaves, turn them into brutes, turn them into animals, but they're not animals. And so it takes an enormous system of oppression and power to turn them into animals. Slavery rests on a fundamental contradiction that the slave is not a human being. But many of the laws recognize the humanity of the slave. Let me give you the obvious example, learning how to read. There are no laws prohibiting you from, from teaching a pig to read. Why not? Because pigs can't read, because they're not human. Why are there laws prohibiting slaves from re reading? If, if they are human, they can read. If they're not human, you don't need a law to prevent them from doing so. And this is actually, in fact, one of the things that Douglas picks up on in a speech that he gives later on July 5th, 1852. This speech is called What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it on July 4th. On July 4th, I always read the Declaration of Independence, and I've added this as a secondary reading, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. You can find it on Ashbrook's webpage, teachingamericanhistory.org. That's a quick plug what we do. Uh, so here's what Douglas has to say. The manhood of the slave is conceded. Let me pause and just restate what I said. Slavery rests on a contradiction. It both recognizes and denies that slaves are human beings. 
And the denial part is what takes this enormous apparatus. So here's Douglas again. The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or write. This is Douglas still. What you can point to any such law, when you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle of your heels, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will agree with you that the slave is a man. So here you see Douglas pointing out the glaring intellectual contradiction that produces, or rather more likely is the post hoc or after the fact justification for this hideous institution that Douglas, citing Thomas Jefferson, says is, quote, worse than the ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose. Douglas says even Thomas Jefferson recognized how evil slavery is. So it's this, it's this contradiction that's at the heart. So I'm going to go through four examples of uh -huh. Douglas's own education. I'm sorry, somebody has a question? Yeah, I was just asking. Please. Um, it wasn't Thomas Jefferson a slave holder, though? Who's asking that? Ellie. I'm oh, sorry, Ellen. Ellen. Sorry. Hey, Ellie. Sure. Yes, uh, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Um, he also uh, deeply opposed slavery. Um, if you want, in the question and answer period at the end, we can discuss this at greater length. Uh, he was a bit of a hypocrite on this. I mean, that's the simple answer. Um, he, when he was a very young man in the Virginia legislature, he was co-sponsor for a bill to get rid of slavery in the state of Virginia. And the guy, he was a very, very junior person to a very senior person. And that senior person's career was ruined and did not succeed. And so Jefferson himself recognized the injustice of slavery. We can fault him for his imperfections for sure. But at the end of his life, uh, he said, and by the way, Douglas seems to confirm this, by the way. He said, the Declaration of Independence was, I did what I could to get rid of slavery. But here's what I mean by that. Jefferson says, when I wrote that line, all men are created equal. I was planting the seed that would lead people to see the enormous contradiction at the root of slavery and how, the, and how if you became committed to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, you would ultimately reject slavery. Now, at the very end of his life, Jefferson laments at, just after the Missouri Compromise. He's like, oh, my God, all my hard work for nothing because they're just going to extend slavery forever. We can fault Jefferson for not living up to his ideals perfectly, but even uh, if you read Douglas's oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln, Douglas uh, praises Jefferson for being for laying out the theoretical groundwork for the anti-slavery argument. So, by the way, does Martin Luther King in his "I Have a Dream" speech. So there, there is this recognition that despite his flaws, that Jefferson is chiefly responsible for the the intellectual thought that leads us to get rid of slavery down the road. To be sure, yeah, it's a great question, Ellie. And we can we can keep on that later if, if, if need be. Um, and but and even what I just quoted, he's quoting Jefferson favorably. So he's. Douglas is quoting Jefferson saying slavery is bad. <laughs> so, and while slavery is still in effect, by the way, in 1850, what did I say, 1852? Yeah, 1852. Very good. So I'm going to go through four examples. And by the way, thanks, Ellie, for interrupting. Keep interrupting. I'm going to go through four examples of Douglas's education in dehumanization. I realize it sounds like a mouthful, but four things that taught him. And by the way, there are more. I just, I've just chosen four of the more prominent examples that show him how awful slavery is. Not just how awful it is, but how it dehumanizes the slave and denies his humanity. I'm going to speak about his grandmother, excuse me, his mother, his grandmother, his aunt, and a fellow slave named Denby. That's at least what I have in mind here. Okay. So I'll start uh, for me with what's the most important thing. Uh, and it's, it didn't move forward, did it? All right, there we go. The last time that uh, Douglas saw his mother. For me, this is the most moving part of the entire book. Um, and one of the things that Douglas goes through here, uh, I admit, I'm, I'll, it sort of gets me teared up eventually, uh, but I'll try, to, I'll try to work through it. Douglas hits you right from the start with what for me is the most powerful example of uh, the dehumanizing effect of slavery and how it rests on a fundamental contradiction. So what's one of the things that slave owners do immediately with children, slave children? They separate them from their mother. Why? Why? Because they know, they recognize that mothers care for their children. And so there's this forced separation to try and diminish that attachment. But the forced separation recognizes that that attachment is there. If that attachment weren't there, you wouldn't have to force the separation to keep them apart. 
Just another small, simple example. Slaves weren't allowed to know their birthdays. Why? Because it humanizes them. But you don't forbid animals from knowing their birthday because they're not capable of knowing their birthday. So another contradiction. Third, by the way, um, did anybody catch who Douglas's father is? Um, he says, I believe in the text that he does not know, but he thinks it um, might have been the, his slave master. That's exactly right. He doesn't know, uh, but he thinks it might be his master. Sorry, I skipped, skipped a slide there. Uh, so it's probably his master. So his master's probably white, which means, and his mother is black. And so he's obviously going to be mixed and his color is not going to be fully black or fully white. And so there's this other, I'll lay out the contradiction here. I'll be somewhat delicate, but there's another contradiction by the way. If they're not human, how can we produce offspring with them? If that, I mean, I'll, I'll try to make this, we're going to talk about his aunt in just a moment. I apologize for how, um, how explicit this, the text is in this regard, but um, you can't produce, humans can't produce offspring with um, the other beasts on the farm. So the fact that he's, that masters are making children with their slaves confirms again that their slaves are human beings. I'll also point out, and Douglas talks about this at some length, that these mixed kids are particularly loathed and hated by the mothers, the mistresses on the plantations, because these mistresses are aware of where these children came from. Their husbands are committing adultery with the slaves. So there are all these contradictions and all these tensions, and I'll just go through it a little bit. I'm going to begin, uh, this is in um, chapter one. This is Douglas on his mother, and I have uh, one of the small quotes here up on the slide, but I'll read a little bit more broadly. Douglas says, I never saw my mother to know her as such more than four or five times in my life, and each of these times was very short in duration and at night. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart who lived about 12 miles from my home. She made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand. And a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise unless a slave has special permission from his or her master to the contrary. A permission which they seldom get and one that gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. I'm skip next to the next paragraph. Uh, called thus suddenly, so she came to see him one time. Called thus suddenly away, she left me without the slightest intimation of who my father was. The whisper that my master was my father may or may not be true and true or false is of but little consequence to my purpose whilst the fact remains and all its glaring odiousness that slave holders have ordained and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers. This is done too obviously to administer to their own lusts. You see the lust of the slaves, slave owners, excuse me, and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. If I, if I commit adultery with my slave, it's pleasant and it's profitable because I've now produced a new slave. Sin compounded upon sin. For by this cunning arrangement, the slaveholder, in cases not a few, sustains to his slaves the double relation of master and father. Um, 12 miles. So there were these laws. They would separate mothers from children. Why? Because they wanted to sort of distract and destroy this attachment. And yet what what Douglas shows you is that his mother still walked to see him. The reason this sort of gets me going is because I, I think about my own mother, and I would encourage you to do the same. What wouldn't your mother do to come see you, right? 12 months. So just think about this for a moment. Frederick Douglass's mother would walk to see him at night, 12 miles after she's worked all day in the field. And then after she's seen him, what does she have to do? She has to get back. That's 24 miles round trip. How far is a marathon? It's 26 miles. This woman is doing a marathon just to spend a, an hour or two with her son right before she's got to turn around and go back home. I mean, for me, this shows me, for me, this shows me, I find this scene particularly beautiful because it shows me the resilience of human nature that try as the slave owners might, they could not stamp out motherly affection for children. It does have some success in stamping out Douglas's love for his mother, except later it, in his life, and here's the quote I have on the slide, he says, I received the tidings of her death with much the same emotions I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. 
So here, I think you see an indication that Douglas is aware, and, and now he's sort of, as an, an adult, he's starting to see, and it's painting him now that he did not have the affection for his mother as a child that he wished that he had. So there's one example. Another example uh, Douglas offers is the treatment of his grandmother after uh, she was too old to work. If you remember the scene, uh, the slave owner just puts grandma out in a field, builds her a little mud hut, and that's the end of it. I cannot help but think that this passage is in part a response to the claim made by U.S. Senator John C. Calhoun, if you've heard of him. In 1837, in the United States Senate, he declared that slavery was a positive good. So unlike Jefferson, who said slavery is bad but was a slave owner and sort of seemed to live in this hypocrisy or turmoil, at some point the Southerners began to say, no, no, no slavery is not some evil that we, we sort of are sort of attached to. It's good. And Calhoun actually says slavery is good for the slaves, especially compared to these in industrial northern places where they just churn workers out. And he's like, we actually take care of our old people when they retire. He says more kind attention is paid to him in sickness or infirmities of age. Compare the slave's condition with the tenants of the poor houses in the civilized parts of Europe, and you'll see that our slaves have it way better off than these workers. And so I suspect that at least in part that what Douglas is doing is showing us uh, that, in fact, all these myths about how slavery is not that bad and, in fact, maybe even good, he's showing us that they're, that they're wrong. And so his, his grandmother has this, uh, she's just put out to die, and I think that that's important. Um, I, I had another thing I wanted to read here. Um, I think I will read this. This is in chapter, chapter 8. He's talking about his grandmother. He's just been assessed. He, this is when he comes back from Baltimore, his slave, his owner dies, and so he's coming back for an assessment. And the grandmother is deemed to be no longer uh, worthy of working, so they send her out to the field. He says the following. Not a slave was left free. All remained slaves from the youngest to the oldest. Oldest, If any one thing in my experience more than any other served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery and to fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders, it was the base ingratitude that they showed to my poor old grandmother. She had served my old master faithfully from youth to old age. She had been the source of all of his wealth. She had populated uh, his plantation with slaves. She had become a great grandmother in his service. She had rocked him in infancy, attended him in childhood, served him through life, and at his death, wiped from his icy brow the cold death sweat and closed his eyes forever. She was nevertheless left a slave, a slave for life, a slave in the hands of strangers. And in their hands, she saw her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren divided like so many sheep and sent off into the world. They turned her out. So another contradiction. His grandmother tenderly nursed his master, but then when the master dies, the master treats her as disposable. There's another example. Um, that's the Demby example. I don't know how much time we'll spend on this, but um, maybe I'll skip this since it looks like we're actually running a little shorter on time than I thought. If you, we can talk about this in the question and answer period if you want. He mentions when he was still a young boy back in the plantation at the beginning, uh, the treatment of his Aunt Hester. Uh, she got a boyfriend and um, it was a, another slave named Lloyd's Ned, and Aunt Hester is caught out with him, and the owner beats her mercilessly. Maybe that's a, it's a very serious and a very adult part of the book, and I hope that you can see why the slave is, is treating uh, Aunt Hester so poorly. She's the most beautiful slave on the plantation, and what you see is not that he's upset that she's away, but that he's actually jealous, and Douglas realizes at a very young age that the whole reason he's beating her is because he has these sexual desires himself for Aunt Hester. And so again, there's this really very sick, very perverted way in which he's powering over her, lording over her. And of course, there's this recognition simultaneously that she's a human being. Humans don't tend to get jealous over the procreative acts of their beasts on the farm, a recognition that she is a human being. There are plenty of other examples. Um, the last one I have here is of a slave named Demby. Uh, he was involved in a murder that was never investigated by the police. This is the illustration of him being in the river after having been whipped. Uh, and the overseer named Mr. Gore says, come out, come out. He says, no, no. And then he just shoots him, blows his head off. And Douglas says, Demby was no more. Curiously, by the way, Douglas is able to describe the most evil things in a sort of beautiful manner. That's kind of it. Um, 
Let me go to the next slide. While you're while Please. you're doing that, I think Eleanor has a question for Please, you. Please, Ellie. Eleanor. Just a, a thought about what we were talking about with motherhood. I thought it was particularly beautiful that we we're speaking of it today, as today is the feast of the Immaculate Conception, and we celebrate the motherhood of Mary and how important the relationship of mother and child is for the two most perfect and most human of human beings and how essential that relationship is to human nature and how if it's broken that really destroys something human. right no that's very good um eleanor i'll just say since you're interested in these things one of the things that douglas i don't know how much of the text you read but one of the things douglas talks about is how uh the religious slave owners were actually the worst slave owners uh because they marry they sort of pervert the religion and then, then it sanctions the most so then the evil is not mine it's sanctioned by god so therefore it leaves me of the moral culpability or whatever uh he was so hard on these guys that uh there were accusations that douglas himself was uh not sympathetic to christianity or a believer at all and so if i don't know what version you have but if you have the one that i have uh, there's an appendix where douglas responds to these charges of being hostile to christianity he denies them. no no in fact it's this perverted form of christianity that that i'm i'm pushing back on so yeah very very helpful okay very good Thank you, Eleanor. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, there's this um, dehumanizing effect on 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 the slave. You see how it, it hurt Douglas, it hurt Sophia, all it hurt his mother, hurt his grandmother. But one of the things that Douglas is trying to show you, and I've already mentioned this, is that it's also the slave owners who are dehumanized, right? We see this in the case of Sophia Ald, the angelic woman who tried to teach him how to, to read. Um, we see this in the case of Captain Anthony, who brutalized his Aunt Hester, and we'll see it shortly in the case of this man that I now have up on the screen named Covey as well. Before moving on to the fight with Covey, I just want to mention two other things briefly that Douglas learns. He learns that the best tactics for snuffing out freedom, uh, and he also has a brief, powerful account of music and why humans sing and listen to music. We can maybe talk about that in the question and answer period. This is one of the most moving parts. He connects, and this is greater than just slaves or anything like this. He seems to put his finger on why music is powerful to human beings. Um, it seems to provide some kind of emotion that soothes us uh, from terrible things that are happening into our lives. So when people say, well, look at all those slaves singing, it's a sign that they're happy. He's like, no, no, singing is a sign that they're miserable. For it's worth. Okay. So I've already talked about a bunch of things. Keep the slaves ignorant, separate the family, kill people like Demby. Those are the big issues. Uh, but in the question and answer right before we began, uh, we also heard, I think, from Kaiser about the things that the slave masters would do to the slaves during the holidays. You can check this out for yourself uh, just fine. It's insidious because it convinces the slaves that they're not fit to be free. And music is the other one, which I mentioned as well. Uh, and maybe we can talk about why it is that music soothes us. But the most exciting part of the book perhaps more exciting than his escape, is this fight that he has with Covey, a slave breaker. Uh, he, in fact, reduced Douglas by Douglas's own account to the status of a brute. Douglas had basically given up on freedom, but then he reached a turning point. So let me give you some of the details leading up to the fight, and then I'll just read a couple of passages for you. So uh douglas is basically out on the farm he's working for the slave owner and he's worked to exhaustion where he can't work anymore and the the, the slave owner mr Co excuse me the slave breaker mr covey says you know do this or you know you're getting some penalty and douglas says you know i can't work anymore i can't work anymore i can't work anymore and finally he just runs off into the, the woods and kind of lays low and hides and he's yelling for him he doesn't come back so then what happens is douglas kind of just stays in the woods uh he actually runs into a guy named sandy and they take care of him they feed him and he comes back uh, Sunday. So he, he gets fed, he gets taken care of, and he goes back. And on Sunday, Covey doesn't mess with him. He leaves him alone. And so Douglas is like, oh, maybe everything's fine. But then what Douglas comes to see is that, no, he was just taking Sunday off because that's the Lord's Day. Another contradiction, I'm sure you can see. But then, he, then what happens is after Sunday, the next working day, Covey seizes him and tries to sort of take him by the throat and kill him. And Douglas himself says, you have seen how a man was made a slave. Now you shall see how a slave was made a man. So Covey did succeed in brutalizing Douglas, but somehow this fight with Covey leads to his freedom. Um, this is in chapter 10. 
the battle with Mr. Covey was the turning point in my career as a slave. Pa pause for just a moment, one moment. So you see that education is really important for his freedom, and fighting is really important for his freedom. Okay. So this battle with Covey was the turning point in my career as a slave. It rekindled the few expiring embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood. It recalled the departed self-confidence and inspired me again with the determination to be free. The gratification afforded by the triumph was a full compensation for whatever else might follow, even death itself. He, can, he only can understand the deep satisfaction which I experienced who has himself repelled by force the bloody arm of slavery. I felt as I never felt before. It was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery. You can hear this religious language. To the heaven of freedom. My long crushed spirit rose. Cowardice departed. Bold defiance took its place. And I now resolved that however long I might remain a slave in form, the day had passed forever when I could be a slave in fact. So this, this manliness business is central to being um, free. I hope you can see I don't, by the way, I don't think this is distinctively male. It's just courage or something like this. Frederick Douglass realizes, and I think this is something we all know because it's captured by the trite phrase, freedom isn't free, that freedom requires a kind of self-assertion, kind of manliness. And you hear this in the Declaration, by the way, where Jefferson says, mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. We're not particularly inclined to sort of stand up courageously and fight for our freedom, but we all know that you have to do so. Education is required for freedom, but so too does Douglas teach us is the willingness to stand up and take it. And that's why the Declaration of Independence, by the way, ends with the following pledges. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It takes courage to be free. Uh, and here's just another silly example, but if you go to Washington, D.C. and visit uh, Douglas's apartment where he used to live, this is actually from the National Park Service from his house. He kept weights on hand because once he became an orator, he still recognized that there was, and by the way, if you see pictures, I mean, he's extremely handsome and tall and powerful. And he, he recognized that there was something to showing how impressive he was to showing that he was fit for freedom. I, I'm at about, I'm showing us at about 50 minutes. I have two or three remarks, which I can just, uh, just we can talk about this maybe in the question and answer period instead of me lecturing on it. One of the other things I wanted to point out that was important for Douglas's education is that early on in his life, he thought that this, the U.S. Constitution was a pro-slavery document. He was in league with abolitionists like William G Lloyd Garrison. I'll, I'm going to do this quickly so you, can, you guys can grill me on this in the question and answer if you will. But at some point in his life, Frederick Douglass changed his mind. So this is another important part in Douglass's education. There's his education in freedom, learning to read, learning about slavery, learning how it's wrong, the education he gives others. And then this last thing is he actually learns about the Constitution, and he learns about the Declaration of Independence. And I'll just point out that this is a change of opinion announced, 1851, which is published in his own journal called The North Star. What he says is actually quite funny. I thought the Constitution was pro-slavery, and then I read it. So this is a strong plug for reading the primary documents. Douglas himself said, when I actually sat down and read the document and I read the declaration to the earlier question from Eleanor about the declaration, I realized that the, you know, maybe, I don't know, you guys are homeschooled. It sounds like an have attended classical school. So maybe you're not uh, poisoned as a lot of the young people these days who hear that the declaration was only going to talk about white men. And it was only when it said all men are created equal, it only meant white men. And the three-fifths clause shows you that it supports slavery in the Constitution. And what Douglas goes through, and he says, if you read these things, without, if you just focus on the primary text, what you'll realize is that the declaration means all men are created equal, and that includes me. And he goes through all of the so-called slave clauses in the Constitution and shows you how properly interpreted each one of them actually was seeking to limit the power of slavery not expand it. And since I'm running a little over time, I'll stop and I'll ask for questions. And if you want, we can go through those various articles and I can show you how, what Douglas says about them. But thanks for your time. I appreciated the questions. I did want to leave some time for comments and questions and I don't have anywhere to be for a little while. So it's up to you all. We'll proceed. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, a quick comment on the last part of that. Please. Uh, I just recently read the document you're talking about that Frederick Douglas did on the 4th of July. 
perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it really is. And I definitely cannot quote it right, but his last statement is like, the Declaration of Independence is not worth the papers written on if it can't protect the weak and humble as well as the strong and proud. Um, and I just think that's such like a beautiful, like this is like he's saying to the Declaration of Independence, like this is this is good. Like we should uphold this. And it's like, but it's not doing its job. Like we have to, we have to uphold it ourselves. Yeah, it's good. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you for that, Ellen. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff in the chat. Yeah, I'll field a question in the chat. Okay, sure, please. Students, if you were to think. So one early on, um, Caleb was asking about uh, specifically the law preventing slaves to read, how, how it's a recognition of the slave's humanity. Um, he asks if it's evidence that tyrants must always live in fear. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think there's probably a lot of ways to spin, a lot of angles to take on the, the yes or no question. Um, as sure. I mean, look, if you did, if you really, this is the, like I said all along that slavery rests on all these contradictions, right? And so if you truly believe that Africans are inferior by nature and are incapable of thinking, you don't need to make laws with severe penalties to prevent them from doing things to reveal that they're equal, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, and by the way, since you asked that question, I'll just mention that um, Natalie mentioned at the beginning that I was raised in Berlin, Germany. And those of you who are looking at me and think, gosh, he must not be older than 25. He's so handsome. But really, I'm very old. And I lived in Berlin, Germany when the wall was still up. And I, since you all seem like you're very good students of history, you'll know what that means. I, I grew up in Berlin. I grew up in the free side, but I grew up in West Berlin when it was surrounded by East Berlin. And you'll see that, I mean, Ch Ch communist China does it now. North Korea does it now. East Germany did it then. The Soviet Union did it then. There were very concerted efforts to keep people from reading certain things. Uh, I mean, it's a consistent theme of tyranny. If you've got to keep the people uh, ignorant, yeah. And slavery is, I mean, I mean, it's just a different stripe uh, of, of, you know, communism is just a different stripe of slavery as far as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and by the way, some of the same things, like when I lived in West Berlin, I can remember as a child seeing evidence of people having tried to escape from East Berlin to West Berlin and failed attempts. And so it was, you could, like, you, if, if communism is so much better you don't need a wall to keep people in with guns to keep them from trying to go over to the, but and so when i was a young man it was it was just crystal clear to common sense like this is this is more compatible with what human nature is like and the same thing with slavery if it takes this enormous force apparatus to keep people down uh, then that suggests to me that that you're doing something that's in violation of human nature yeah great question Caleb. i have a question what Please. was Douglas's like view on the Civil War because he, I mean, he was alive during it, was he not? Big fan. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, no, mean that to be so glib, but um, I, if you want to find out what Frederick Douglass thought about the Civil War, the best document to read is his oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I was given in 1876 uh, in Washington D.C., uh, and it was the first statue. Resurrect, uh, erected, excuse me, in Washington, D.C., honoring Abraham Lincoln. So before the famous one that now exists. And it's nuanced. I mean, on the one hand, obviously, it's, it's horrible, and there are these terrible things, and it wasn't fast enough, and it was sad that it took all these lives. But on the other hand, he saw clearly that what I think a lot of Southern historians have tried to whitewash, and that's that the Civil War was about slavery. And Lincoln was the guy to handle it. And it's a very beautiful speech because it sort of begins by praising Lincoln. He's this very impressive human being. And then it sort of shifts and says, but he was slow. And he said these nasty things about us. And he wanted to send us to Africa or some other colony. And he didn't, he vetoed the first emancipation proclamation. And then it turns in the third part to say, you know, from the anti-slavery view, from the slave's point of view, Lincoln was slow, uh, tardy, and dullard. But if you view him from the, uh, the view of a statesman, you realize Lincoln was fast, quick, and nimble, and impressive. And so there, you can see his, I think his view of the Civil War is kind of connected with his view of Lincoln. It was this bad thing that was necessary that achieved a very good thing. I hope that is some, some help. And by the way, uh, he met with Lincoln during the Civil War um, about things. Yeah, including, by the way, that, you know, using uh, African-American soldiers and these kinds of things. Very good question.
Yeah, he learned the evil through the absence of the good. That's right, Kayla. Yeah. And there's one more open question in the chat um, I'll throw in. This is from William. Um, so he asks which scene you would attach more importance to um, in the life of Frederick Douglass, the recognition of the importance of education with Mr. Ald or the fight with Mr. Cody. Um, yeah. So that, that opens up a lot about uh, those kind of parallels you were drawing with education on the one hand, but also physical strength and force on the other. Right. I mean, I, you're trying to make me choose between two things that I think Douglas sees are both necessary for freedom. That's kind of the, and this is in a way this connects to Ellen's question about the Civil War. Wouldn't it be great if we could just think it out and not have war? But Douglas seems to recognize, unfortunately, that you're probably going to need force to, to stop this horrible institution. Um, so I'll, I'll, I, I hate when students hedge on these things. So I'll say I'll say in my own name. Oh man, I was about to pick something I couldn't, and I went back to the other side. Uh, the education seems to be what showed him that he was capable of freedom, but he was at his lowest when he was with Covey. And so for me, the fight is what, that's what reignites it for him. And that he says himself, that was the turning point in his career. So, and if you've ever been in a situation in your own life where you've had to stand up for yourself, I think you realize how more, how meaningful and important that can be. So if, if forced to, to choose William... I would say the fight with Covey. And by the way, chapter 10, which contains the fight, is by far the longest chapter in the whole book, signaling its importance as well, I would say. And it's, I don't know about you, but as I, I mean, if you, if you guys read chapter 10, like the hair on the back of my head starts tingling and standing up. Like I'm, I, like I'm in Douglas's position and I'm fighting Covey, right? I mean, like it's so impressive. And there's a, another account of it in one of his other, other bio, biographies where he goes into a little more detail um, and where he says, you know, Covey's like, hey, come help other slave. And the other slave's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not paid to fight. Thanks so much. And then he tried to enlist this woman as well. Uh, and he does, I don't think he mentions that in the narrative. That's only in the later, later one. So all the other slaves are like, nope, we're out. It's, a, it's your fight. I'm a hired hand here. So the fight, I would have to say. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? I had one more question. Go for it. Um, so you were talking earlier about how um, Frederick Douglass had read about the um, Constitution, and that was in the book, that the um, Constitution was, he originally thought was for slavery, and then he realized it was against slavery. Did he have any thoughts on the um, writings of John Locke, who largely influenced the philosophy of the founders. Uh, I can't think of anywhere that he that he mentions Locke specifically, um, but he seems to have been well read in uh, liberal thought generally. Let me check something real quick. I don't remember any mentions of Locke. He seems to mention principally American authors. I don't know. That's an excellent question, Vincent. I'll have to look it up. I can't think of anywhere on top of my head where he mentions John Locke. That would be my short answer. All right. Thank you. That's a great question. And, you, and you're right, Vincent, to note, by the way, how much Jefferson is indebted to uh, John Locke. And I would just add that those of you who think that you know this, uh, if you actually read the entire second treatise, you realize it's not just the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness bit. It's, it's like the whole declaration is permeated with language taken from, uh, from the second treatise. Yeah, very good question. He went to Scotland for a while, by the way, Douglas. Some of these speeches that I actually read from I were given in Scotland. Because, you know, of course, he's, he was a slave on the run for a while once he got his freedom. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things I would like to mention also quick is uh, how you said slavery has its uh, blatant contradictions. And if you're going to try and have a society which has slavery without contradictions, you can't assume that all men would be, or all people would be created equal. Right. Um, first off, and uh, you'd right. have to assume that the slaves would be below. And in which case you couldn't have religions like Christianity endorsing it. It's a very good point. 
and you see why therefore that's a great that's a great point kaiser you see why jefferson thought that people sort of said you didn't do enough for slavery you didn't do enough for slavery and he's like you're right but i did the one thing i did that i think is is super big is i planted this seed in the minds of all americans that all men are created equal and it you we can't last as a country with this contradiction in our heads between all men are created equal and slavery and if you'll know if, i mean i don't know how familiar you are with early american history but so many of um, so many of the early American things, uh, legal legislation, were limiting slavery. So, for example, in the Constitution, there's an article saying that uh, the slave trade cannot be prohibited until was it 1803, 1804? And guess what happens as soon as? And by the way, this is one of the things Douglas talks about. He says see, this is something people point to and say, "See, this is pro-slavery. They were protecting the slave trade for 19 years." And he's like, "No, no, no. That was they were planning to get rid of the slave trade." And guess what? The very first day of session of Congress of that year. They already had a bill in effect. Uh, they already bill, had a bill written, excuse me, that went into effect the first day that they were constitutionally allowed to prohibit slavery. Do you know who the president was who signed that law that went into effect on the first day they were constitutionally able to hear that slavery was? Thomas Jefferson. So, I mean, he's like, we were gradually, the earlier thinkers were like, we will gradually snuff slavery out. And you can see why, why Jefferson was like, oh, my God, the Missouri Compromise completely opened it up and completely shifted the direction of things. Lincoln will say something similar about the Kansas-Nebraska Act, that that similarly is, is a turning in the other direction of slavery. And this is what he says brings him back into politics because he said, look, it was going the right way. And then this Kansas-Nebraska Act, bad news. Yeah. Yeah. And um... – I would also like to say in Lincoln's speeches in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he also says that he doesn't advocate for the immediate abolition of all slavery. Right. He instead wants to cut it off, all of its growth, and then from there work inwards to um, eradicate it. Like it's easier to do it slowly than to nip it right away um, because then there would be um a reaction from the um slave owning areas right. if you read those speeches from the lincoln douglas debates i would encourage you to look at where they were geographically uh, he gives one series of speeches in the southern part of italy one in the central and one in the northern and what you'll notice is that lincoln adapts what he says based on his audience he's mass he's a master of rhetoric and he's very consistent although he hedges in different ways he sounds more pro-slavery when he's speaking in Southern Illinois, but if you pay close attention to the words, I mean, not no one was doing this. If you pay close attention to the words, you realize he actually doesn't say anything pro-slavery at all. Um, and Lincoln, I don't know if you know this, but we we have the Lincoln Douglas debates thanks to Lincoln. He was the one that wanted them published, and he was very fastidious and careful about no, I punctuated it this way, and this needs to be italicized, and this. Right, because he wanted he he knew that these the precise usage of words was extremely important, because yeah, because I want to get rid of slavery, but I gotta you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, Kaiser. Um, I wanted to ask that: Do you think that the behavior of um, slaveholders to their slaves could be comparable to that of a cult leader in their? Um, members? That's a good question. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that Douglas talks about how some of these slave owners would use or abuse religion to try and keep the slaves thinking it's their rightful place. And some of them would actually point to passages in the scriptures and say, see, that slavery sanctioned, and therefore that's why you should be. Paul even says, be a good slave. You're a slave. Be a good slave. Um, so there is, I think there is this religious component to it. Yes. And there is this sort of similar brainwash i mean look at sophia ald right you take a, a totally normal human normal human being who sees a cute little kid who wants to read and you're like well i'm gonna teach him to read like something has to happen to somebody to get their brain to not recognize a cute little kid as a cute little kid but as a menacing threat who can't be taught to read right that there's there's definitely a cult-like brainwashing going on there so yeah i think that that's a good analogy i mean there are probably some ways in which it's different but there are some ways in which it's the same, like any analogy. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting to see how these liberal education, and when we're receiving a liberal education, we're taught so often that the truth sets you free and learning about 
like how to read is what right. sets you free and how literally it sets him free in this book. Isn't that beautiful? It is. You know, you, you really, I really want, I think this should be mandatory reading for all young people because you see like how valuable education is. It's, I mean, you know, we all, we like to, you know, I teach at a college where so many students are interested in, well, what's going to get me a job and what's going to get me this and what's gonna, it's like, no, no, no. This, like this is about you being a free human being and, and, seeing things clearly for yourselves and not being brainwashed like Sophia all about things. No, that's absolutely right, Eleanor. Yeah. I mean, the light goes off on him as a young kid. He realizes, oh my God, reading is what it is. Re reading is going to do it. Mm -hmm. And he, we know from other writings that one of the, and I think different chapters in this book that he uh, even taught others how to read with the Bible. So. That's great. I I think we're ending roughly where we started with that. Um, Good. Thank you for all the students for joining us. Really glad you're here. Dr. McBrayer, thank you again. This has been really fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, students. But You guys make it like my my nightmare was me just talking to a blank screen and, and having no facial, no, no feedback. and no. So thank you for talking. I appreciate your questions. And you guys are some impressive young people. So good luck to you all.